All right, welcome to You Are Not Normal with Tony Mon. I got a good friend of mine here, Danny McBrin, who uh, uh, drove down to the office today. Yeah. On a on a, it, it's not that hot outside anymore. Like the last couple of days, right? It's not 115. It's 100. It's 103. It's 103, which is not that hot in Arizona right now. No. But it's hot as shit in this office. Yeah. Right? It's a so. little. I might break a sweat or two. So. I'm already sweating. But. That's why we're black. <laughs> That's but okay. Thanks for coming in. We were just talking about um, JV deals before we got started here. Yep. And that's something I think is important where, you know, it it's there's a lot of beginners that are locking up deals that aren't deals. Yep. And well, like, what do you see is the biggest issue that they're having? Why are they locking up deals that aren't deals. Like we talked about, you know, picking markets and, you know, if a seller just is a complete lay down on your first call and takes your first offer, that's not typical. Maybe there's something going on yep. there. Like yeah. what do you, what are you seeing with, with, with these newbies? The new thing, I mean, I've been doing this for five years, so I know when someone signs super quick or something is, feels like it's easy or this is like too good to be true. Like I'm already, like waiting or predicting like what's gonna go wrong or why is this too easy yeah so like people get so excited or maybe they're getting premature about cashing a, a big deal or something like if something's coming easy to me i am i'm thinking what's wrong with this deal right if someone signs super quick or they're talking to me so in depth or they're trying to sell me the deal i'm almost like whoa like what's wrong with this deal yeah. what title issue is is there like what thing or what information are they withholding from me and that's kind of like where my head's going at it but i think like we were saying before like if the the best deals they are extremely hard to get mm -hmm. <laughs> like the seller doesn't want to talk to you they're in distress they're getting 20 other calls so what are you going to do differently than yeah. the competition to actually get that good high quality deal because anyone can lock up a deal in East Bumblefuck um, and get it contracted, uh, do the novation, put it on investor lift and, and never sell it. Right. But feel good because I got the contract. Yeah. It's a weird, it's an industry where there's a dopamine release when you get a contract, yep. but a contract don't mean shit if you can't sell it. Nope. So there's definitely the fulfillment side and wholesaling is super important. And that's where a lot of people fail is the disposition side. But you have to know the disposition of the deal and the exit strategy and your buyer and the market you're in before you even lock up a deal. Because if yep. you don't know that market and you don't know your buyers, you could just be locking up a contract just for locking up a contract. And, and I, I think us that have been doing this for a while, we get a little bit more cynical than yeah. somebody just getting started. So when we see a seller just lay down or it seems too easy, like my for my reaction is always, have you had this under contract before? Like yep, what's what's yep. going on with this thing? Has it been through probate? I start digging into prop stream. Like what is going on with this deal where this yep. guy is just it's too easy. Yeah, and I don't mean to be cynical or, you know, some people in my office would be like, oh, you have such a bad attitude or something sometimes. And I'm like, no, dude. Like I am logical and realistic of the things that have happened in the past and the things that will occur with you know some of these deals yeah so you know my biggest thing like if if i'm a newbie or things that they can take away from this today it's like if you're using zillow or prop stream like the biggest thing is like the what's active on the market there if right. you're in east bumblefuck what is active <laughs> is that a real place east <laughs> bumblefuck it's somewhere i think in arizona here <laughs> i mean I've been i was to, gonna guess alabama but yeah. all right arizona i mean I've, i feel like i've been to every single small city in this in this state like i've traveled throughout the entire state and um i've done deals in i've done deals in aho i've done deals in winkleman like the absolute smallest mining towns, weirdest fucking places you can imagine. But I also got a deal. Right. I got a deal, a deal for five to 15 grand. Yep. And that properties are selling at 80 to 100. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, that's a good point because the first deal I dispoed when I started my new JV company was a deal in rural Tennessee. 
which a guy sent me and I ran the numbers on it and I looked at the comps, which me and you are very similar that way, where when the first thing I look at on a deal is what's listed, what's pending. Yep. Like that's the immediate data. Like you can look back six months, 90 days, but like, you know, if yours, your deal's a deal just by looking on the MLS, like right. what's for sale. Right. And we use the MLS a lot too. So it's like, I think a lot, I think a lot of these newbies can just with that strategy, if you, if you are wondering if you have a deal, look at what's listed, what's pending. If your property is not going to be attractive on the MLS, it's not going to be attractive off market either. Right. But let me um, finish my thought. I got a squirrel brain. Uh, the I was saying the first deal I dispoed with the JV company guy sent me. Um, it was like a town of four thousand people in the mountains of Tennessee, and he's like. Dude, I blasted this on Investor Lift. There, it, it's not a deal. Yeah. And I was like, let me look at it. And I looked at it, and he locked it up for sixty, trying to get eighty for it, worth every penny. I was like confident in it, where I'm like, Dude, I would buy this deal, right? <laughs> so I'm looking at it, and uh, and and I'm like, oh, these are the gems. I like the rural deals. Like most yeah. people don't, but if there's some buyers there, and we have a deal, like I'm gonna dispo it because the buyers aren't getting a ton of opportunities like they do in Atlanta or right. Raleigh or Phoenix. So when, when a wholesaler locks up a deal in a good rural market where there's some activity, like those are the deals I really like. Cause once you get a hold of the buyers, they're like, Holy shit. Yeah, this is awesome. Right. What do you got? An, how does this work? I've never yep. done an assignment fee. And then it's like, you're, you're walking them through it, but they're easier to work with. It's a little slower process because they're not in a rush because they know you're not going to sell it to anybody else. They're the only buyer there. But I sold that deal in two days and, you know, we made, I think, 10 grand on it or something. Um, and it was a deal where this kid was just like, it's too rural. I'm like, right. well, you, you just got to look at the data. But the reason I knew it was a deal was because what was listed and what was pending. Right. And I'm like, it's going to be the cheapest thing by 30 grand. That's out there. Yeah. A, a good analogy I always say, and I posted a couple of videos about this. It's like, like people overcomplicate this stuff. And it's like, let's say that, you know, we were selling plasma TVs or something and Walmart was selling. Plasma. I could, <laughs> what, was it 2003? I could go hey, whatever flat screen TV, whatever plasma. TV you want right. to say. Yeah, but projector TV. Projector we're selling projector TV. TV and it has the uh, apps already built in. Okay. So there you go. Um, but let's say I could go to Walmart and get that TV for $100 and you come and bring me, let's say you get TV somewhere else and you come and bring me that TV and you say, Dan, I want to give it, to, give this TV to you for $120. I can go to Walmart and get that same TV for $100. So you're bringing me absolutely no value. And the no same value. is true for a real estate deal. If the same deal is on the MLS for 20k cheaper why would i buy your deal yep now to reverse that if you came and brought me that tv for 50 dollars and i can go somewhere else and get it for a hundred dollars now you're bringing value to the marketplace of course so. and it goes both ways like we're talking about jv partners sending us deals and us looking at them but it goes both ways with the seller too if you're talking to a seller and you're trying to get a property under contract and you're in the negotiation stage. I don't know why some people, maybe it's just n just new people, but like I always talk about the comps. Yep. It's like, why would I pay a hundred grand for your property when there's a property on the MLS that's in better shape for 80 grand? Correct. Like it's a great way to negotiate on the seller side. And it's a great way to negotiate on the on the buyer side when you're trying to dispo a deal. It's all right. that current data. That's a great analogy. And that is uh, that's okay to talk about that too. And it's okay to be transparent with the seller that you know me and my team. We say, hey, the reason I'm calling you and the reason I'm going off market is because I'm trying to get a better deal than what's on market. Of course. And as of right now you're giving me a worse deal than yeah. I can get on market. I'll go to Walmart and buy a house. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I was, it, I was at a guy's house yesterday, probably over by you. I don't even know where the hell I was. I'm, I live in East Mesa. Yeah, you know, it was. The, it looked like East Mesa. I don't know where I was. <laughs> I don't live in East Mesa, <laughs> by the way. I live in a good part of Mesa. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
Um, but I was in this neighborhood. I went to this guy's house. He's, he's moving, he's selling his house. He has worked construction forever. He's walking around with a cane and a top hat on character. Right. Definitely a Sounds character. Sounds like a wholesale avatar. Yeah, it was. And he's getting rid of a bunch of stuff for free. And I'm a junk collector. You, you are know? a hoarder. Yeah. I'm a hoarder when it comes to old, cool shit. And I wanted some cinder blocks for my workout station in the backyard. I got ropes. I'm tying around them, all this stuff, right? And he had a bunch yeah. of cinder blocks for free. Turns out he had a bunch of weights for free, too. So I got a bunch of free weights, too, and curl bars and straight nice. bars. It was awesome. But he's, I'm like, what are you doing with all this stuff? Can I, you know, buy your wheelbarrow? Can I buy your, uh, your wet uh, saw? And he's just like, yeah, yeah, eventually. But I'm, I'm nervous about selling all this stuff. But like, he's trying to hold on to it. But, okay. um, he's that's beside the point. He, uh, he said he had just sold this house and he's buying a house up like in uh, Chino Valley or some shit up by yeah, Prescott. It's... So I'm like, well, how did you sell it on market? And he goes, no, no. He goes, you know, the, the guys that call the time and send the letters. He's like, I just picked a couple of those guys. And one of them gave me a, a decent offer. He sent a bunch of investors in here. We negotiated after that. I wanted 300. The highest came in at 292.5. He's like, I know this guy's going to make some money on it. The investor is going to make money on it, but it's super easy for me. I don't yep. got to clean the place up. I got so much junk. They said they'd get rid of it. He's like, so I'm, I'm happy like that. That guy knows his house is getting wholesaled. Yep. Right. I told him to cancel the contract and ghost the guy so I could buy it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Now I know why my sellers. Are calling <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he, he didn't care. He, he no. knew the game and, uh, you know, I think transparency helps a lot of the objections and a lot of the reasons deals get canceled because of seller issues, buyer issues. Type. Like if, if everybody's transparent about the process, then I think that does cut out a lot of the a right. lot of the problems. Right. And you're also trying to you're you're trying to fit a square into a circle like that. If that guy is my my seller like i'm all over that guy and then the, the other calls that i'm fielding like this is just the person who's owner occupied who wants 30k over zillow who is you know your more sophisticated seller like they're just not my wholesale avatar right and i talk about the wholesale avatar like you talking about that guy who's reasonable wants to sell as is knows he has a lot of junk understands the process like that is that is That's the avatar the yeah. so a lot of you guys, you're trying to just fit something that is just not ever going to fit into the right box. That's a great point. The One of my guys, um, uh, Spencer, in one of my communities had just posted this on our Facebook group where he said, hey, maybe an unpopular opinion. And he said just that. He's like, spend time with sellers that you can make a deal out of a deal. If right away they're, they want market value, they're owner occupied, they're not super motivated. Bought it two years ago. Bought it two years. Like, yeah, throw them into a, a drip campaign. Maybe something's going to happen. Yep. But but you have so many leads. Like I used to, used to bang my head against the wall at our office because we had 13,000 leads in our system. And, you know, these guys are sending me deals to comp, like in the middle of nowhere where nothing has sold in the last two years. Uh, the guy wants some outrageous, uh, you know, price for it. He doesn't want to sell, but he will at the right price. And they're sending me this deal. And I'm like, we have so many leads. You know how many leads yeah. are in our system in Raleigh and, you know, Fayetteville and all these other places where I'm like, spend your time with a with a seller that you know is going to make you money right and i think you know i always run like a quick analysis a quick report of of our deals and you know we have 20 to 25 direct to seller deals every month and nine i think about two months ago i did this and it was 92 percent of all of those contracts on the board were an absentee owner mm -hmm. so none of those uh Every single, just about every single one of those leads did not live in that property as their primary, yeah. primary home. Absentee owners, right. always easier. You're not trying to get an owner to leave their property. Yep. You're trying to get an owner to kick a tenant out. That's probably a shitty tenant where yep. they're not making money anyway. Like a lot of the times on those types of deals, 
guys own the property for 20, 30 years. High equity. High equity. Yeah. He's got a tenant in there that's paying $400 a month. The tenant's been in there for 15 years. Like sometimes he pays, sometimes. Like when yep. you start breaking the numbers down for these sellers, and I, you're like, yeah, I know you've owned this property outright for 15 years. You're bringing in five grand a year on the rent. Like you're actually losing money on the yeah. property every year. Like I'm gonna give you 80 grand for it. It's how long would it take you to make this 80 grand from your current situation? Right. And they're probably older, want to cash out. Like I'm just looking for. And if you're running a team too, like your team doesn't have to underwrite or get into the nitty gritty of the numbers, but everyone should have some type of awareness of what what is my ideal avatar and what do i need to efficiently spend time on yeah and i call it like a uh you know leave the hard underwriting to me like but mm -hmm. you can do a soft underwrite sure you can see you can look at zillow you can look at what we use monsoon out here um which is like tax records mm -hmm. so you can see what they paid for it when they bought it um we also have in our discord chat since we've been using that for almost two years, like you can put the address in there and I have two years of underwriting data in there. So you can see if it was under, was it underwritten at some point before? Has it been in our system before? So that helps a lot. And you can do a soft underwrite to, you know, get some more information about the lead and the property. Yeah. Right off the rip too. Like that, uh, we would, we would, uh, tell our closers to do that as well, where it's like, hey, before you even send me this deal to comp, like why not just look on Zillow real quick and see if the numbers even align right. where you know where you're spending your time efficiently, for sure. Right. Well, you talked about you know having a team and, and that structure, like why don't you tell everybody kind of what you do out here in Arizona, how long you've been doing it, and uh, what your team looks like. Cause w when did we meet? Like three years ago at an all-in event? The first time we ever met was in Florida, like, yeah, almost three years ago. What was I remember that? at Chris Rude's event. That oh, was the first time was... I ever, I'm, yeah, that was, uh, I believe that was the first time we ever met. Okay. Yeah. yeah that was probably three years yep. ago, close to it. In Destin and Carlos was there, Art Sanchez. Uh, yeah. It was, it was definitely a good Nick crew. Perry was Nick there. Nick Perry. Yeah. That yeah. was a, yeah, that was a good event. It was a great event. Yeah. It was the yeah. first time, uh, I met. I think it was the first time I met Nick, first time I met you. Um, and then what were you doing back then? Like how involved were you with, with whole, the wholesaling model? I was model? pretty involved. I mean, I, I, I'm still there on the day-to-day -day basis doing some underwriting. Obviously, my role is a lot different now than it was three years ago. I'm not locking up as many deals, but, you know, people come and go too. So I'm never like... Um, you know, I'm, I'm always humble enough to put a headset back on to get a deal or two to, you know, all right, we're now rehiring. So we're going to be in a, we're losing a seat for the next two to six weeks. Like, all right, let me put my acquisitions hat on. Let me throw in some deals and let me get some revenue up on the board in the meantime of doing interviews and sorting through people. So, um, you know, in five years, I've never not been too good enough to lock up a deal or, you know, yeah. that's a high value uh you know opportunity yeah so. me and eric were the same way too like even on a day when the energy was just down or we didn't get a deal the day before oh, the suck so or, suck or something like yeah. eric would come out he'd lock up a deal i'd run through our buyers list on a couple deals get you know dispo a deal and just prove a point right. and get the energy back up but especially if we lost a seat and somebody left or you know got let go like I'm sitting in the cubicle headset on and banging yep. it out. <clears throat> and there's a couple of people in the, the lineup that we just said down at Chris Rudes and Dustin that would preach, oh, you're not a business owner right. if you put a headset on. Right. I haven't wore a headset in 10 years. And now those, like, where are those people now? They're not, right. their wholesale companies are gone at right, the very right. least. Um, as an owner of a company and as a leader, you have to be willing to do every aspect of yeah. every job when, when you need to. I mean, obviously our roles and our energy is better spent on building the business and the team and looking at it from a bird's eye view so we can, we can scale right. and get efficient and make, everybody can make money. But when it's needed, throw that fucking headset yeah. on and get to work. I mean, to say the least, uh, about a month ago or so we had, and our office is in East Mesa. It's not the greatest area, as you know. 
and <laughs> someone i was gone that friday or something and one of our acquisition guys goes through the back door and there's just like a nasty smell and someone a, a junkie literally came and took a squatted down and took a shit like right next to our door hell yeah and at first i thought it was one of our competitors that you know doesn't like me yeah so that's I a was, power move there. i was thinking that's that's what it was from but you know we watched the cameras and it was literally someone came and uh you saw them and they squatted down took a shit and uh yeah sorry you know, about that i had a burrito <laughs> that day but um yeah. You know, I, I tried to make it not as messy for you, but, but you know, I get back East that Mesa next, burritos. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get back that Monday, and, and it's all hard and crispy, and, you know, everyone was like, I'm not fucking touching that. I'm not doing it. And I got down with a piece of cardboard. I threw it in a bag and yeah. threw the shit out. But, you know, I, I'm never not... Uh, You're never you know, above that. I'm never, never above, above to, picking up shit. Right, correct, or... I'm never above to, you know, take out the trash or clean a bathroom. Like that's what I used to do when I worked at Enterprise. Like, yeah, I would clean the bathrooms before I left. And, um, you know, I'm the type of person that I will treat the person who's lowest on the totem pole all the way up to the CEO. I'm going to treat everyone the same, yep. you know, and that says that. a lot about people or you see in our industry who maybe they go to an event and they just talk to someone super quick and then they go and see the speaker and then they're all about the speaker. You know what mm. I mean? Like you don't see them treat all of these individuals the right. same and equally, and they fanboy out. Right, they yeah. fanboy or they they hop on the bandwagon, and then that person there tying their boat too falls off, and they spit them out and go to the next person. You know? Yeah, so you see that a lot in this industry, a big time. Yeah, so I was a volunteer firefighter back home for like a year and a half, and I remember my captain at my station. You know, he said something that kind of stuck with me, and he was just like, "Hey, at the end of the day, we're all janitors." Yep. He's like, "If all the work's done, the truck's clean, our equipment's good, we're not on a call, pick up a fucking mop." Right. And he would do it. Everybody would do it. We would all clean, and it just kind of stuck with me through my career. When I started, you know, building businesses, it was always like, "I will do anything I'm going to ask my team. Like I'm going to do, do that as yeah. well." Yeah, and right? that. Also, from your team's perspective, they're gonna respect you as a leader, you know, a lot more than someone who thinks they're above, um, you know, certain things sure. that they shouldn't do. But to piggyback off of kind of like the team and what it looks like today, so I own fifty percent of the company um, with Kurt, you know, as you know, and uh, shout out to Kurt, shout out to Kurt. Um, so Kurt and I are fifty fifty on the business. We started it over four years ago uh, from some humble beginnings and. Uh, uh, we have three acquisitions guys right now. Um, a couple people just left, so we're going through some changes the past couple weeks, which is always good, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have three acquisitions guys on the sales floor. I do the underwriting uh, for them on a day-to-day -day basis, and we have two Dispo people. These are all people in our office, too, in Mesa. Uh, two Dispo people. Uh, one act, uh, one transaction coordinator uh, slash she does some you know paralegal work because we're getting into these uh, creative and complex deals a Me bit. Me and Kurt so. were talking about that a yep. couple weekends ago. So those are really um, I'll get into those, but I'm super excited about those. And then we have a marketing manager uh, who manages all the VAs. We have about 20 VAs, so that's between cold callers, texters, uh, lead managers, some administration work. So there's a lot to keep track of and a lot to manage, but yeah. that that's what the team looks like today. Yeah. And uh, what are you focused on mostly? Cause I know like your social media, uh, you've been growing a, an audience and you know, I don't, I'm not a person to like scroll on Instagram and like follow a bunch of people, but I will say, like for your content, every time every time one of your reels pops up, I always watch the whole thing. Yeah. I think you do a great job. You're very handsome. <laughs> Thanks, um, to Joe. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I know you put a filter on that lens, but yep. it works. Um, but you know, you do a great job, kind of explaining. You you know you you have a dry sense of humor and similar to yours, similar yeah. to mine. You talk a little shit. Um, whether it's about the property or what, or the area, it's just, it's funny and it's, uh, very insightful and it's very specific because you guys, uh, you flip mobile homes, you're, yep. you're into that. That's what a lot of your content's about. 
And, you know, I don't know if you have, you know, big goals about teaching that model, but I, you know, you do a good job of it on Instagram and I think it's a great, you know, strategy. And I think a lot of people, uh, benefit from your reels and could benefit from you teaching them that model. Yeah. Yeah, Coaching and you know, the stuff that you're doing is definitely something I want to get into more. I just did a mobile home training class. So that was a great turnout. And how many people showed up for that? You never uh, answered me when I, Oh yeah. About 15 people were on there. That's great. So good for you. It's pretty awesome. And you know, it's a niche. So like, I love the mobile homes because it's different. People like things that are, um, not the same redundant thing. So it's a certain asset class. It's a certain niche. And, uh, so, you know, social media wise, I'm more trying to grow what I'm niching down into is, which is getting mobile homes and then getting distressed titles. Mm -hmm. So that is what I am focused on for the next, you know, pretty long time is, is acquiring off market mobile homes on own land and getting into distress titles. Yeah. So, and then what is your Instagram, by the way, uh, Danny McBrin. So you guys can follow me on there and two ends. Yep. Two ends. Mm-hmm. I have some reels and uh, I'm still doing all my captions. Joe's going to be helping me out soon with some of my <laughs> captions and uploading because we were just talking about that. I'm getting a little overwhelmed with stuff. So yeah, yeah. he's going to help me out with stuff. Um, but, you know, he has a great dry sense of humor too. So Good. Yeah. He'll he'll be on there as well. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm super excited to, you know, I attended that Logan Fulmer mastermind and, yeah, no, uh, Logan. Yeah. Getting into, you know, that guy's got, that guy's up to some big things. Yeah. And the stuff he's doing is so much more high level. It's, it's complex. It's difficult. It's mm-hmm. risky. Like it's things that are just like, if you want, and I've done about f- four of these deals. And it's so funny because I went to the event and I did these deals like a year ago and I was doing it. I was already doing it. And then I went to the event and they're like, all right, this is how you do it generally. And I was like, oh shit, I did that, you know? Mm-hmm. And I had no idea what I was doing. Like, you know, I was talking with Kurt. All right, do we do this? Scratching our head. Like, you know, just give someone 10 grand and then we Let's get the deed, <laughs> not through the title company. And like, I was like, fuck dude, I'm nervous. And you know, I'm yeah. talking with him, talking with our attorney, talking with the title company. It's like no idea what I was doing, but I was just figuring it out along the way. Yeah. So, and then I went to the event and it kind of solidified everything I've already done. And I'm like, shit, this is, this can be a real process, a real thing that, that we do. And, and we can do a lot more of these deals. And yeah. that I'm super excited about these because there is a ton of money in these distress titles. Yeah. Yeah. And then money. me and Kurt, were talking about a couple deals you guys are doing one in particular, but yeah, it seems super interesting. And that's what gets my motor running. Cause it's like, you know, with, with regular wholesale deals, I mean, they get, you know, redundant, yeah. right? It's the same thing, same process, same seller, same buyers, you're signing assigning deals so i think people like us we just want to be challenged and we want to learn yes and we want to it does something to our ego maybe too <laughs> maybe it def i mean i think it definitely does where it's like no i figured this shit out like i can do something not everybody can do it's a good yep. feeling i don't think there's anything wrong with that no um, i like wrong. doing really difficult things and then people are like holy shit how did you do that it's like right. i fucking took a risk you know and i yep. figured it out um well that's awesome dude and uh, yeah um with the so with the wholesale company you guys are cranking you're doing these flips on the mobile homes now the distressed titles your partner kurt's awesome yep. you know friends with him um i would you know i i hung out with you guys a couple of weeks ago we kayaked down the colorado river horseshoe bend yep. horseshoe bend yep. and then took a, a boat time. out the next day um and then uh this week friend of mine, Harlan was in town. Who's like your guys' age as well. And, you know, I met all you guys years ago when I was first getting into this business. And like, I will say, I kind of feel like everybody's stepdad because I'm a little older, yeah, a little bit. especially driving the boat. Cause no, you get clowns. don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you don't even know how to tie off a goddamn boat on a cleat, which, you know, frustrates me in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. But I was, as you said, when I was driving, bracing for impact. Uh, yeah. Bracing it's... for impact the whole time. Danny's just fucking full throttle. Let's yep. hit shit. Who cares? Um, you did a great job, Thanks. but 
um it, it, it's cool watching like god I, I just i i don't know how to say this without sounding old but like watching you guys in your 20s like yeah. you know just kill it and figure this shit out at your age because i didn't get into wholesaling until i was 37 or something and i mean i had other businesses before that but i didn't even start my first business until i was 25 and uh you know watching you guys and being able to you know become friends with you and watching you guys grow and help in any way i can and i learned so much from you as well yeah, like even the other weekend like just chatting with you guys about you know what you're doing with the distressed titles and you know i think it's it's just a great relationship uh we have within this you know wholesale business uh when we meet people at events or meet people years ago and we we stay uh friends um but you know kudos to you and and you know all the guys in their 20s that yeah. are that are killing it because it just like inspires me and it's like damn these guys are fucking doing great when they're my age they're going to be buying private jets yeah you know hopefully one day yeah but, and that's why it's like you know we we're talking about the gurus and all the kind of fake stuff in the industry when someone's like 18 19 20 it's like you got to think too it's like there's only so much of life and experience that they have uh been through so it's like someone that's 30 40 50 years old like that in your mind all right they don't have a lambo they don't have all this stuff like like, but in your mind, that's the person that you should be gravitating towards. Like who has been running an operation successfully, who has been, um, you know, maybe a little older, like those people are going to have some real raw experience rather than, you know, your 19 year old posting with a Lambo that's been yeah. in the business for two years or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. a good, it's a good point. And people like, I think you're the same as me. Like, I, I don't think we use our social media to post pictures of Lamborghinis and Rolexes. No, no. Not that there's anything wrong with that either. Like I say that a lot too. It's like people find inspiration from every direction. And if it's going to get somebody off the couch and get to work and learn something like, you know, th those, those people are drawn to the flashy stuff and that's right. what their motivation is. That's just not me. It's probably not you no, either. Not. I mean, you drive a shitty pickup truck, so it's an F-150. Um, <laughs> well, that's why it's shitty. It's a Ford. <laughs> Um, but like, just like giving value, being down to earth, being yeah. logical, uh, you know, there's people that are drawn to that as well. You yeah. know, it seems like a smaller audience, but they're the, the people that are drawn to, you know, your social media or mine too. It's like, they're, they're really appreciative and really committed too. Cause like they're, you know, they're drawn to that down to earth, logical step-by-step -step yeah. process in person. Well, it's like some, you might have a larger audience than me, but I have a deeper audience. You know, yep. my 10,000 followers are real. I know them personally. We've made connections. We've shook hands. Like, and someone might have 50,000 followers, but those people drop you in, in a second, you know? Yeah. And, and they're not going to, gonna, yeah, they're not going to, you know, buy any coaching from you or see you at an event or yep. anything they might be on there just because of the flash right so, exactly but you know to each their own there's there's flash there's people that are motivated by that and there's uh people that are motivated by you know double wides yeah exactly so <laughs> an acre and aj <laughs> yeah <So. laughs> an acre and aj hell yeah that needs to be a movie title yeah it does all right bud well thanks for coming in today yeah um do you want to leave the audience with uh with anything any nuggets anything where to um, find you what you're working on youtube you're doing youtube yeah now? i'm doing youtube so i'm uploading i mean we're doing joe and i are doing shorts on youtube i have almost 100 subscribers i have over 100 videos on there um so we're going to get into some more long form content over the next couple months so youtube is danny mcbrin instagram is danny mcbrin uh you know like i said the biggest thing i'm working on now is is adding those distressed titles and getting into more of those deals. So I'm looking forward to that. So if you have any deals like that, where there's multiple owners, deceased owners, very complex stuff that needs to be unraveled, you know, you guys can, can let me know or shoot me a DM and, uh, you know, stick to the fundamentals. Like the biggest thing I can leave on a closing remark is that I'm not, so I, I go to this event and you could see this a lot, like people go to an event and they're ready to just uh, can what they're doing and start this whole new thing. Like <laughs> yeah. I've already done some of these distressed title deals and I am just adding another vertical, another layer to what I'm already doing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm by no means stopping the wholesaling, stopping the mobile home flipping, stopping doing JV deals. Like all of that 
is still going to work. And now I'm adding something that works in harmony with those other things. Yeah. So if you haven't uh, perfected your craft or, uh, you know, established yourself in the wholesaling, in the flipping, whatever it is, like you still have to keep your main thing, the main thing. Yes. So don't lose sight of um, what got you here. Exactly. Don't lose sight of what, what put you here in the first place. Yeah. That's a great point. Uh, great uh, to leave on yep. because I think that's a major issue where, Huge. well, especially with the coaching too, because a lot of these coaching platforms and mentorships are teaching something three steps ahead from locking right. up a wholesale deal. Yep. And it's like, you can get so scatterbrained, spend your money on a coaching program where, you know, it, you're, you're not ready for it yet. Yep. Like As, you need to learn marketing, you lean, need to learn sales, you need to get some contracts, you need to get some money rolling in before you can start adding flipping, before you can start adding lending hard money yep. or uh, distressed titles or complicated things, or even something as simple as, as novations. It's yep. like, get some wholesale deals under your belt first because novations, they're not, they're not always a walk in the park. Like no. get something down and learn it and get good at it. And then just start adding as you go. And you've been doing this five years yep. and you just slowly add stuff. Slow growth. Yeah. yeah. And, because you'll fail if you don't. Yeah. And Root, like Root always says at his events, is like, you got to go to elementary school first. People are trying to apply for their PhD before they've even gone through elementary yeah. school, which is wholesaling and then moving on incrementally. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate you having me on and always yeah. good to connect and yeah. thanks, shoot buddy. the shits with it. So Hell yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us on You Are Not Normal. For Danny McBrin, Tony Mott, we'll see you at the top. What's up, guys? Thanks for watching my video. If you'd like to watch more videos, my playlist is right here. And if you'd like to subscribe, click down here. I'll see you guys at the top.